So engineering, you know, which, which bit of engineering are you, on, are you interested in? You know, mechanical predominantly. But it's not quite as simple as the, as the main headline areas that we're all familiar with. Because, you know, what about aeronautical? Where's that? What about offshore? What about energy? Well, actually, the good news is that if you have a passion for something like mechanical, then that passion and those skills ought to be able to uh, be applied really straightforwardly into the aeronautical sector, into offshore sector. Offshore is having a rough time, it's not disappeared. And into energy, Drew and I are both in the Institute for Energy Systems, and uh, the energy, sustainable energy, is one of the great grand challenges at the moment that the world faces alongside things like uh, uh, healthcare, uh, big data, and water. So, you, know, you as a researcher, it's essential that one positions oneself under where the funding is coming from, and so energy is a good place to be standing under. Uh, but from the point of view of career, there's similar sorts of things. You want to be in a sector that's thriving and going to the future. And so you are not constrained, is the big message. But whether you have enthusiasm, motivation, imagination, you're not constrained. Uh, so let's do some flyers and see when they come. These are the four traditional branches of engineering I've taught here at Edinburgh. We exist in a school of engineering. We became a school of engineering, heavens, Crivens, uh, 14 years ago now. Um, it seems extraordinary that we ever existed as four separate departments, given that so much of the interesting stuff happens in the interfaces between these. And that's certainly true of research. Our Energy Systems Institute uh, combines people from mechanical, electrical, and chemical engineering. It's also true of the teaching. Heavens, you can't be a mechanical engineer and not have any idea of how a motor or control system works. You certainly can't be in sustainable energy without having some sense of that join up between the mechanical side and the electrical side. Uh, there's very much two-way traffic of information happens between the electrical generator, for instance, and the mechanical device that's capturing the energy. So it's really, it's a great thing that we're in a combined school. Um, nevertheless, uh, the tradition in the UK and the employer expectation is to see degrees which are uh, in the traditional disciplines, but again, we hope that doesn't constrain you. You'll find in first year that you spend a bit of time doing other disciplines than mechanical. You need, heaven forbid, you might decide to jump across to civil or something like that uh, after the first semester. And then you'll find that you become very much into doing mechanical. But when you get down to the senior honours years of fourth and fifth year, you'll find the options open out again. And a number of options taught by our civil engineering colleagues, for instance, in fire safety, uh, fire dynamics, uh, in structures which are very attractive to mechanicals. I don't know if Caroline, if you're enrolled in any of those, but there's certainly opportunities across these boundaries. I won't dwell on these because I'm guessing you've probably felt pretty much figured this out. Um, F1, F1 ain't what it used to be. Uh, but it's not a complete trick because we have had placement students getting involved in F1 at Lotus, for instance, and at Mercedes. So it's, it's, not, it's not a complete Impossibility. There is an increase in active formula student activity here as well. Um, in manufacturing, uh, the vast majority of the population thinks that things just pop out of factories. Uh, and actually, you get inside, it's an extraordinary business. And however mundane it might sound, there's always something interesting to be happening. I got involved in a consultancy in a biscuit factory a number of years ago. So apart from the glorious smell, it was also pretty interesting. And the samples were great as well. So anything in manufacturing, when you actually have got a drive and enthusiasm and excitement, you're going to find some interesting stuff uh, in manufacturing. And there's tremendous opportunities there. Aerospace, every year a number of our placement students get involved in the aerospace sector. We've got people going to Rolls-Royce and Darby, which is the ultimate blue chip aerospace company that you could ever imagine. Uh, they repeat customers for two of our students every year. Uh, we have people going to um, Airbus Industries uh, in Hanover and elsewhere. So aerospace is active. Offshore is having a rough time at the moment, uh, but nevertheless, uh, there's still a big offshore sector out there. It's not, it ceased to grow, uh, but there's still a big sector out there, and there's baby boomers retiring left, right, and centre. So if you're interested in offshore, it's not about to go away tomorrow. But actually, many of the technologies are transferring into other areas uh, with similar skill sets and similar requirements and infrastructure. And offshore wind is going to be the single biggest um, 
uh, added capacity and sustainable electricity generation in Northern Europe over the next decade, without doubt. And just reason, one of the reasons, I'll, I didn't think I was late, but one of the reasons I turned out to be late is I'm just finishing off reviewing 19 research proposals in this space and sending them off to, um, to the, the model ship in Holland. And uh, really those are applying to, to explore aspects of offshore wind were winning all the time because they had this case to make of their impact, their immediate impact on, on an industry which is emerging fast, whose costs are still a little bit high, and who need those technology advancements. So offshore wind is here to stay, and is a very exciting technology. And when it all comes too much, we need our consumer goods and our luxuries. And uh, it's so easy to overlook the role of mechanical engineers all around us in product design. Some working at the interface with places like our College of Art in product design. What else have we got? Sports. Um, one of the more enjoyable mornings in my professional life in recent years, I was the internal examiner of a PhD in our um, uh, physical education department. Uh, the chap had been exploring the aerodynamics of a swimmer, an Olympic swimmer in the glide phase. And I went in thinking, ah, oh, well, we're engineers, we know about this stuff, what are these sports scientists going to know? My God, they were good. They, they were really, really good. And the external examiner was none other than the Russian national Olympic swimming team coach, who was actually one of the best classical hydrodynamicists I've ever met. So it was a hugely fun experience, and a fantastic PhD. So sports science is right in there, that's of course a lot of uh, money involved in that as well. And medical, this is a crossover between another of the great grand challenges uh, is personalised medical care and uh, uh, engineering medicine. And so we have a role to play as engineers in working with the medical profession, exploring all sorts of aspects of bioengineering. And this is, I think, flowing in a stimulus artery, perhaps? I'm not quite sure. Uh, and design. Design is the overarching thing. I was at a talk yesterday at our postgraduates of an annual conference. Were you there the STG? No, you were last year, weren't you? Um, and uh, the speaker, the keynote, was saying, well, heavens, we have to have the passion and we have to be ready to, to, to have the imagination. We have to do what humans do best in a world where machines will do the other stuff. And so if you think of an engineering product and engineering design going from that first brilliant idea in the bathtub through to the commercial product, over here you're doing lots of sums and lots of computing and lots of computer modelling and things like that, and due diligence and economics. And you, as you get further over to this side, you're doing more and more routine computations of computers are very good at. But over this side, that's what we're good at, is the imagination and the ideas and the initial approval of that. So, Please, you remember that design is what it should all be about ultimately. That's what humans are good at. That's what hopefully I'm a graduate engineer is going to be good at. Okay, and research. That's what we do in our spare time. Um, I think Adam wants to make the point that research, um, if you go back 10 or 15 years, I think research was probably an encumbrance to good teaching. People were appointed because they were staggeringly good researchers and they were interested in doing teaching. Uh, and people only wanted to spend their time doing research. That, I can absolutely assure you, has changed around 180 degrees. Nobody's going to get a job now who's not up for not just teaching, but actually passionately teaching and teaching in an innovative way. These things don't change overnight, but I can tell you we've appointed something like uh, 15 new people in mechanical engineering in the last four and a half years, and they are committed and they're up for it. So research feeds into teaching, particularly in the senior honours years, we are doing very advanced courses, uh, for instance, in marine energy, as a specialist area that we have. Uh, the honours course here uh, is, is co-delivered with the master's course here. There's a number of courses at that level which are co-delivered with master's courses. It gives you an indication of the level of the work at the top end of the undergraduate programme. And I think this is one of Adam's, the guy who usually presents, my colleague, um, he, he was a, a, a recent appointee and it's one of his sketches from his uh, third year design principles course, I think. Does that sound right? Was it actually John Chick's sketch? I'm not sure. No, 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 it was uh, one of the students at Adam's class. Oh, it was one of the students at Adam's class, even better. Wasn't Lucy, that fantastic? Lucy got some extra ideas from the students at the end of Yeah, well, there you go. That's the, the left-hand end of my spectrum of, of, of what humans do best and what machines do best. And if you've got, if you've got a class of 50 students, 
And they're as bright as our class, you can eat some bloody good ideas. It was certainly the one lecture they wouldn't have thought of. That's great. Isn't it? And that, that also tells you the power of a hand sketch. The other thing is, when you get to computer sketches, it implies precision. Early stage of design, you don't have that certainty. Hand sketch is actually, in many ways, a more appropriate way to convey and communicate that information visually than the computer rendered image, because you've got a sense of its certainty and uncertainty. Um, OK, this is up, up my neck of the woods. Uh, and, and Joe's, this is, uh, this is our flowway facility, 22 metre diameter, the world's first circular combined wave and current testing facility, designed to really support the uh, research and the development community in, in offshore marine renewables, so wave and tidal. Um, it's, let's see if we can play it. Um, waves have got a peculiar property, water waves, water waves move at speed depending on their wavelength. And so the longer waves travel faster than shorter waves. So if you start off a bunch of uh, short waves, and then longer waves, and then longer waves, and longer waves, and you get them all, all the crests to meet at one point at one time, you get something fairly spectacular. It just shows how well controlled those wave panels are. So there's 168 wave panels around the side, so you can get your waves in any direction in combination of directions. And underneath, you can't see there are 28 massive impellers to allow you to maneuver uh, your current in any direction that you like as well at an arbitrary angle to the wave field that you may wish. So it's an absolutely unique facility. Um, it's only two and a half years old and it's, 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 it's chock a block at the moment, which is great. So my PhD student has just finished a two week period in there um, last week, which is very exciting, very nerve wracking, and ultimately very successful. Um, anyway, you know that. Uh, this last one is interesting, however, the E and N, whatever you've applied to, if you do the right courses selection in first year, if you keep up your electrical as an outside course, you can jump across that. If you're interested in energy, it's an extraordinarily powerful combination, particularly in sustainable energy, because bits of me mechanical stuff join up with bits of electrical stuff, and trying to design one in the absence of knowledge of the other is, is really a bit of a non-starter. It's not unique in the UK, but it's one of the UK's it's very unusual and it's fully accredited by both the Institution of Mechanical Engineers and the Institution of Engineering and Technology who accredit electrical engineering degrees. So that's a very powerful combination. These are great degrees as well. The widths are just flavourings. Uh, the, the width management, the width renewable energy, is still hardcore mechanical engineering degrees, fully accredited by the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. Um, but they just give you a little bit of a badging of your interest and you're, you're taking out one or two advanced. Uh, technical topics and dropping in some advanced management topics in this case, and we're focusing on advanced technical topics in the area of sustainable energy in that case. The decision between this and this and this come after, se after first semester in the second year, so you don't really need to worry too much about that at all. And similarly, uh, if you start in the first year and you do the right course options, you can decide to start the second year if actually you had a passion for the electrical and the mechanical, or if actually you were more mechanical or, heaven forbid, more electrical. And I won't spend long on this either. Uh, the first year, you do a third year, you're doing engineering, a third year, you're doing maths, and a third year, you're doing something else. It could be something else like informatics, or chemistry, or physics. You know, it could be something that supports your studies, or it could be something completely different. You could be doing ancient history, um, or you know, what, what some of the other popular ones. I, I used to be able to reel them all off. Uh, so you've got a little bit of flexibility to, to spread your wings in first year. Um, economics is a good one. Astrobiology was popular last year. You could do a language. In second year, you're doing predominantly mecha engine maths, and a bit of introduction to management. And in third year, you're really just doing mecha engine. Fourth year, things broaden out again. You have industrial placement. Uh, we are again not unique but quite unusual in having integrated placement. The placement activity is, takes place for six months, covering your second semester of your fourth year and running on into the summer, a minimum of six months. Um, it is fully integrated, it's credit bearing, it's assessed. Uh, one of the reasons is that the Scottish system is a five year MNH degree, so it would be inconceivable to turn that into a six year degree by giving you a whole year placement. But equally, we are very firm that. Um, that the placement is a transformative experience and just doing a, a summer internship does not carry that weight and will not give you that experience. The employers are equally convinced that really for them the tipping point is somewhere around four to six months where they start to have got a return on their investment. If they've just got you for three months, investing and training you are not getting much back. 
but for six months you'll do this pretty serious graduate work by the end of it. MA is versus B end, I encourage you not to bother about that at the moment, apart from doing your financial spreadsheets into the year ahead, years ahead, because um, the buzzword is bifurcated. The decision comes at the end of third year, regardless of what program you're enrolled upon. You achieve 55% overall in the third year. You have the option to proceed to one more year to BEng or two more years to MEng. Um, uh, if you get less than 55%, the, the decision is made for you, and you'll proceed to the BEng. Um, if you're engaged and maintain your motivation and you can organise your life sufficiently well, there ought to be little difficulty, little or no difficulty in achieving that 55%. The intention not to ease people out at that stage. It is worth noting that certainly in the UK, many employers look to the MNG as the normal entry minimum. Okay, uh, study abroad. I, my hat these days, uh, is as director of internationalisation, I'm absolutely passionate about talked about the transformative experience of, indu experience of industrial placement. Equally transformative is the opportunity to have experience overseas, be that as part of your formal programme, or perhaps a third year exchange, or as part of a summer, uh, summer programme. So there's some of the destinations that our students find themselves in on the third year exchanges here largely and some of the summer exchanges here. So there's a wide, wide variety. If you're interested, the best thing you could do is to get a whole bunch of fantastic results in your first year, because the application happens during the first semester of second year, and is largely based on a combination of your ambassadorial qualities and your first year transcripts. So go ahead and get a bunch of A's and B's in your first year, and think hard about what we are looking for in a student to participate, and you should be highly competitive to take part in the third year abroad if you're interested in that. States. You recognise some of these places. These are great places. The placement, uh, we have already had a bit of a, uh, a positive rant about the placement. We've got a list of uh, nearly 200 companies that we've built up over 14 years across every sector and every size from General Motors down to one person consultancies. Across the sectors, offshore renewables, automotive, aerospace. You, know, you name it, it's been done, somebody's done it, and that's great news for you. Um, so there's lots of fantastic opportunities. Also worldwide, all the dominance is in the UK. Uh, people have done placements in Thailand, in, in Alaska, in, uh, in Laos, in New Zealand, you know, all sorts of possibilities. My chap in New Zealand uh, could never quite get around to writing his monthly reports because he was busy sailing, sailing from New Zealand to Fiji and things like that. So. Got a poor mark in his monthlies. And um, what do graduates get up to? Well, you've probably read all of this already, but uh, the most important thing is they get up to something. They get up to something useful, and uh, so the graduate employment is very high, and doing something else useful afterwards is also uh, uh, very encouraging. The job market isn't quite what it was in the mid 20 zeros. But it's building and our graduates are doing well. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.